Hi friends, my name is Tris, and this is No Boilerplate, focusing on fast, technical videos. Today we're going to build the foundations of a single-player journaling game, based on my sci-fi podcast, Lost Terminal, about a little AI alone on a space station. I'm going to show you what I think is the best way to design Rust programs, which is to make invalid states unrepresentable. Much of Rust's ergonomics come from its rich type system. The more detail you put into your typed model, the more the compiler can help you, and in many cases, suggests correct code for you. But how do we design programs in Rust? There's no classes. As we go through this design process, I will show parallels with traditional OOP design patterns. And that starts with replacing classes. Rust loosely couples data and behavior. But as you can see, the combination of structs for data and implement blocks for behavior should be a very familiar analog for a class, though it is more flexible, as we will see. Let's build our space station. We start off naming our satellite. The debug trait allows for printing the struct in a programmer-friendly format, which saves a lot of time while you're prototyping. RandGen is part of the RandDerive2 crate, allowing us to randomize our structure's data. Our satellite is going to be named one of these names. I could have used a string here, but that doesn't allow the type system to give us any superpowers. For instance, I could use the Rand crate to generate a random string, but it would just be a bunch of random characters, not what we're looking for. Let's plug our name enum into the station. Here is our space station struct. It has a name, which is one of the limited collection of valid names which NASA, the Federation, or whoever allows us to use. A version number, so we can tell the different satellites that are of the same name apart, and a vector of sections. As you will recall, a vector in Rust is like a list in other languages. There can be any number of sections, including none. Our first Rust pattern is the constructor pattern. Rust structs do not require a method like this to create them. You can just do it directly. However, very often you want to control how a struct is created. The convention is to implement the new method, as I have done here. In my new method, it randomizes the station's name, version, and sections. We are using the incredible rand crate to do this. You will notice that no matter what type we are randomizing for, we don't need to call different functions. This is worth highlighting, as it's another superpower you get with Rust's type system. The rand crate lets you generate all kinds of random values. On line 1, we see a random int. Line 3, a random character, line 5, a random float, and more complexly, on line 7 and 8, we shuffle a vector. Importing the rand prelude gets us the trait that adds the shuffle method to vex, and many other handy features. But how does the compiler know what kind of random value to return from these random functions? This is called type inference. And unlike in Java and many other languages, the compiler can infer based on both sides of the equal sign, left as well as right. This means, typically, you only need to add type annotations to function signatures, and the compiler figures out the rest. Back to the space station. Here I've defined a section. A section is a room on our station specialised for one task. Note you can define your structs and enums in any order. Here we are using the section name enum before defining it. I like this because it feels like a step closer to literate programming, which represents a move away from writing programs in the manner and order imposed by the computer, and instead enables us to develop programs in the order demanded by the logic and flow of our thoughts. Talk to Don Knuth for more on that. For our simple game, a section is either active or inactive. And once again, we'll define the valid section names, as these are standard on satellites. We'll randomize the configuration for our game when we implement it later. As I said, the game we are building is based on my Hope Punk podcast, Lost Terminal, which follows the journey of a little satellite trying to understand what has happened after Earth stops returning his calls. It is set an unknown number of years after the global climate apocalypse, where we find out what has happened back on Earth through the lens of our narrator, an AI named Seth. I write and perform every episode, as well as having composed the music. I coded the first two seasons as a CLI app and screen recorded them through a CRT terminal emulator called Cool Retro Term, which is a general purpose POSIX terminal that runs on Linux and OS X. You should try it, it's amazing. Hope Punk is a nice genre to be writing stories in. It's a kind of antidote to Grimdark, where things go from bad to worse and only the bad guys win. In Lost Terminal, though the world as we know it has ended, rebuilding is possible. Every ad-free episode is available on Spotify, iTunes, YouTube, or the dozens of other normal places you would expect to find a podcast. Links are on lostterminal.com, and I'll link to the first episode at the end of this video. I might be biased, but I think you're going to love it. Let's continue building our own little space station. Here, we're using the Inquire crate, a terrific command line interaction crate that allows us to build interactive menus, auto-completing lists, input lines with good read line support, and more. We'll be using just the menu and text input from it in our game. Here, I've wrapped Inquire's select struct, which will create our menu system in-game. 
The second argument to the new constructor of select is the vector of string menu options. Here's what it will look like when we run our game. Note the cursor. If you type, it fuzzy finds the menu item you're looking for. Very cool. Later on in our code, we're defining a days left method for our station struct. Our game ends when the number of working sections reaches zero. Future versions of our game could have different categories of section. Perhaps as long as the solar panels keep your batteries charged, you wake up in the morning and continue work. That's how it is in Lost Terminal, anyway. Note the first parameter of our method is called self. How familiar, coming from object orientation. For this method, I chose to make self a read-only borrow, which is what the ampersand means. As you can see in the body, I do not mutate the station. This method is a good example of Rust's iterator pattern. Most lists of things in Rust are either iterators or can be made into iterators like here using the iter method. By the way, if you forget to use the iter method on the sections vector as I did initially, don't worry, the compiler will tell you how to fix it. Let's write two more helper methods that give us a vector of strings of working station sections and one of broken sections. Note that we can make as many implement blocks for station as we like. They don't all have to be in the same place, though for organization you might like to refactor them into one spot. These two methods are quite similar to the last one, so we will continue. It's worth mentioning at this point that all code blocks in my presentation are passed through the compiler. How do I do this? The code blocks are stripped out of my markdown and concatenated into the main.rs live as I write my presentation. Not all code is shown, imports and lint config and such are hidden for brevity, but they are all in the markdown for you to examine at your leisure. Please be kind about my code, I'd love suggestions, and I'm still learning a lot about Rust every day. Onwards. We are now digging into the power of enums. Back when I defined our section name enum, I snuck in a crate called strum, which allows converting enum variants to strings and strings to enum variants. That is what we are doing here in the from stir method that was added to our enum by deriving the enum string trait. I'm not delighted by having to resort to indexing the vector. I wonder if there's something more clever I could be doing. Do let me know if so. Finally, we have our main game loop. Every day we wake up, find out what is broken on our space station, and decide if we want to spend our time fixing it or spend our time doing science while we still can. First, we start an infinite loop. We will break out of it only when the days left are zero, which are when the game ends, or if the user volunteers to power down early in the menu at the bottom. Each day, we prompt the user for their station log, where they can journal how their last day went, what science experiments they had run, what sections had broken overnight, and more importantly, how they feel about all that. Though we've built a very simple game in terms of mechanics, the genius of journaling games are to provide a structure onto which the imagination of the user can be allowed to run free. It seems to me that to write Rust is to model the valid states of a system, then write functions to move between those states. This way of designing systems is the way that Fred Brooks recommended in his 1975 book, The Mythical Man Month. Fred's words are what the Rust compiler would say, I think, if it could talk. Make the compiler's job easy, and you'll make your job, your team's job, and your future self's job easy too. If you'd like to see what you can write in Rust, click the top video. I used it to make a fun retro computer visualization for my Hope Punk podcast, Lost Terminal. Or if urban fantasy is more your bag, click the bottom video to listen to a strange and beautiful podcast I produce called Modem Prometheus. Transcripts and compile checked markdown source code are available on GitHub, links in the description, and corrections are in the pinned errata comment. Thank you so much for watching. See you on Discord.